Appreciate y'all being here tonight. I really do. I look forward to this time of day. We're living in a time where uh, churches are cutting out their Sunday evening service. And um, one church after another is doing that. And, you know, from time to time, I've given it some thought, but I don't know. I just think that this day belongs, this whole day belongs to the Lord. And we, we dedicate ourselves to Him, not just one service, uh, but just coming together again, fellowshipping, reading God's Word, learning from God's Word. Uh, dedicating ourselves, putting our uh, everything else aside for that. And, um, you know, I, I don't see anything in Scripture that commands us. We have to go to church twice on Sunday, once on Wednesday night. There is no commandment. So why are we here? We're here because we want to be here. Okay? So as long as somebody wants to be here, I'll be here with you. Amen. Uh, we're going to start out in Matthew 13, so go ahead and turn your Bible there, and um, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and uh, pray for this church, uh, pray for one another, um, pray, uh, y'all help me pray about a decision that I'm trying to make um, concerning going to Kenya, um, we're just kind of praying about that right now, about uh, if we should go, when we should go, and so on. We're looking at uh, the idea of doing a pastor's training seminar. It will involve the pastors from Turkana, where our radio station, and Samburu, where our radio stations are, both of those places. And so just kind of help us pray about that, about uh, if, if we should do it. Uh, when we should do it, and so on. But I think uh, it would give us, it would give me really a, a really good indication of of what these radio stations are doing in that area. Uh, I mean, I hear things every now and then that I like. Uh, Muslims wanting Bibles, Muslims coming down being saved, uh, the Catholic Church, us being on their top priority. Okay? They don't like us. They really, really don't like our radio station in Turkana. So, as long as the Lord is pleased to keep it going, we'll keep it going. But it, it would just kind of give me a sense of, of uh, who, who it is we're reaching, how many we're reaching, and so on. And, um, you know, the pastors in that area don't have access. To, they don't have access to the Bible institutes or the Bible colleges. Or not that that's a, a, a bad thing, but they don't have access to a lot of the things that I've taken for granted that God has given me. And so uh, just help us pray about that, about, you know, when to do it, if we should do it, and so on. Does that make sense to everybody? All right. So that's kind of what's in my heart right now. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, Matthew chapter 13. And um, I'm actually releasing um, this particular teaching uh, on the Internet as we speak. This is one of the things we did down in Harrison. And um, so I, th I thought, why should I just do it in Harrison? Why not teach my own people this? Amen. So anyway, Satan's, Satan's biggest enemy. Satan's biggest enemy. All right. And uh, let's learn something from the Lord tonight. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you, God, for giving us access to your throne by way of Jesus Christ. We thank you that that access is free. We thank you, Lord, that it is provided by your mercy and by the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you, Lord, that we don't believe what others believe, that you have to go through the Pope or go through some sort of man on this earth. Father, we go directly to you by way of Jesus Christ, being led of the Holy Spirit, Father, we thank you for that. We ask you, God, that you would uh, be authority over us, that your word would be truly in authority over our minds, over our hearts. 
over our actions and our attitudes. I pray, Heavenly Father, that uh, you would equip us to live in the days that we're living in. Father, help us to battle sin. Help us to battle, uh, Lord, the, the attack of the enemy. Help us to, uh, to fight and to stand against things that are false. Help us, dear God, to love one another. And Father, just I pray, dear God, that you would fix our minds on your word tonight. And guide us and lead us. And Lord, help us to go to battle against the devil. And all the things that he tries to do, Lord, to get at us. I pray, God, that you would just give us victory. Bless your word tonight. Bless these people, I pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Matthew chapter 13. Uh, I've got it there on the screen. Uh, the relevant portion, or you have your Bible open. And um, there, well, I won't say that. Uh, you guys know me. If I put it on the screen, that's good. That's one thing. But get your Bible out. And, and you people at home, okay? Don't just watch your computer screen. Of course, watch your computer screen, but don't watch other things on your computer screen while you're watching us, okay? And, uh, get, but get your Bible out and, and make some, make, put little markings in there. Jot things down. Make some notes of some of the things that you learned. Or maybe, maybe a lot of times while the preacher's preaching, God may say something to you, maybe not quite dealing with what, I'm preaching about, but while God's got your attention, write it down. Okay, it's a good idea. Matthew 13, verse 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. When the blade was sprung up, and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. Now, let's stop right here for a minute, and let's get uh, an understanding of, and we're going we're gonna to learn it uh, a little bit later on, Matthew 13. We're going to learn that the, the enemy that sold them is the devil, and we're going to learn all that. But let's go back while we got this part in our mind. We know the enemy sowed tares in among the wheat. We know the wheat is the good seed. Uh, and, and the father is the one who sowed the seed. And we know who the enemy is. So let's go back and look at when the seed was sown. Go to Genesis chapter 2 and Genesis chapter 3. I, I used Genesis 3 this morning in our Sunday school lesson. Using it again now. Uh, in verse 8 of Genesis 2, the Lord God planted a garden eastward at Eden. There he put the man whom he had formed. Uh, so think about this. Here's the garden of God. And in this garden, he sowed his good seed, did he not? He put all these trees in there and put all this. And then he put man in the garden. Okay, And man has got seed. He's got DNA. Seed is DNA. It's a DNA word. So uh, verse 9, Out of the ground made the Lord, grow, uh, Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, the good seed is that tree of life. As Adam has access to the tree of life, the, the, the prevailing theory is that as long as Adam has access to the tree of life, he's going to live for however long he can partake of that tree. That's how long he's going to live. So, I guess technically... Had Satan not intervened, or let's say even Adam didn't fall for it, then Adam and Eve would still be in the garden, and they would still be alive this day. 6,000 years old they would be, because they're having access to the tree of life. All right? The tree of life produces fruit. They eat of that fruit. That fruit has DNA in it. Okay, it's the good seed. So then, but then we have the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So then God says to him, uh, let's see here, I'm back in Genesis 2. Uh, God says to him, uh, uh, verse 16, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, 
And notice that he did not say, neither shalt thou touch it. He did not say that. That is not in God's word. Uh, that thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And I did. I, I just thought, you know, I wonder how many words in this phrase that God said. 39 words here. So here you have a microcosm of the whole law, the 39 books of the Old Testament. And now, if, if numbers aren't your thing, you, when you look at this, you're still looking at a microcosm of the law. Because God gave the commandment, so there's one commandment, therefore there's one sin. And Paul talks about this in Romans 5. Whereas by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, uh, you know, then he talks about the one man idea. As one man entered in, as for, you know, by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, so by one man life is brought. And that one man is Jesus Christ. Okay? So, so and then in Romans 5, God said, he, the Bible says God multiplied the law. So now instead of one sin, one law, now there's a multitude of things that we can't do. Amen? Because we do a multitude of things. Okay? So now, that's the law. That's the good seed. Man abides by the law. Man has access to the tree of life. Man lives. You got that? Now the enemy. The enemy comes in. Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, if God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Doubting God's word. The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. That is not true. God did not say that. Okay? Woman in the Bible is always a type of a church or a religious entity of some kind, whether it's good or bad. And in this case, it's bad. Because here you have the woman taking God's word and then adding to God's word. And you have a whole history full of evil church-like organizations that have added to God's word. Think of the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon has added to the word of God. They've added a, a whole list of instructions. Mormons can't drink coffee. Uh, I never did know why. Huh? Oh, they changed it? Wow. They, they had a law, then they changed it. Mormons had to, if you're a Mormon man, you had to marry a bunch of women. But then they changed that. But God, you know, God gave them a new revelation when the Supreme Court said, you can't do that. All of a sudden they get a revelation from God saying, oh, God's changed that, okay? But they've added to God's Word. Roman Catholic Church, adding to God's Word when they tell everybody, don't trust the Bible, trust the Pope. And whatever the Pope says, and when the Pope says this, then we have to do this. If the Pope says this about Mary, then we have to believe that about Mary. If the Pope says this about purgatory, then we have to believe that about purgatory. They added to God's Word. That's who Eve represents. But anyway... Uh, let's see here. And believe it or not, she's playing along with this. And remember about lust and temptation. We're not supposed to say that when we're tempted, that we're tempted by God. James said, we are tempted when we are drawn away of our own lust and enticed. So to say that temptation is all the devil's fault, we didn't have anything to do with it, it's not true. We're co-conspirators. Amen? So now, uh, back at uh, chapter 3 again. In verse 4, the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Now he's directly contradicting the word of God. And then, he's given her the poison. The real poison is, since you can't trust God, because God told you a lie, I'm going to give you a secret doctrine that God didn't want you to know. So he said, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So then we know the rest of the story, alright? So that to me is the devil sowing the tares 
in among the wheat. Now, who's got tares in them? Okay? Now, aren't you glad that the master said, don't kill them yet? It's not time yet. Okay? So if we go back now to Matthew 13, uh, verse 26, But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? And he said unto them, Monsanto hath done this. That's pretty good, wasn't it? Okay. And you know what? There's a lot of truth to what I just said. The good seed is what God gave us to live on. Monsanto and all these other seed companies have decided that God's seed that he gave man is not sufficient. It's not good enough. So what has he done? He's added to it. He's taken away from it. He's changed it. Given something else in its place. Okay? These seed companies are, are playing the enemy sowing tares in among the wheat. Okay? So now, but let me read it the King James way, the right way. He said unto them, verse 28, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Amen? Aren't you glad that God has given you chance? He's given you sufficient time in your life to say, I know the tares are here. God, when it comes time, separate me out from the tares. Se get, separate me out. I don't want to be, I don't want to be in this body forever. So, verse 30, let them both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, gather you together first the tares, bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, what I'm teaching you is Satan's greatest enemy. Now you could say, well, his, he, he, Satan hates the blood, he doesn't like the blood, and so his enemy's the blood. I, well, that's, that's not too bad. Um, or you can say, uh, his enemy is Christ, it was, so had try, try to have Christ killed on the earth, and so on. And that's also true. However, the very first thing that Satan did in this world was against God's word. Immediately after God has given his commandment to Adam, Adam being therefore able to live technically for as long as he has access to the tree of life, he can live. And the devil by this time knows that he has, he has been uh, put out from his position in heaven as the anointed cherub that covereth because of his pride now he has fallen and... You know, the Bible says, What is man that thou art mindful of him? He has made him a little lower than the angels, and yet you have exalted him. So I think the devil knows that God is going to exalt man, and he's going to have Satan fall down. So in his mind, I guess he thinks, If I can destroy man, then I will have dominion over the earth. Okay? That's what he's trying to do. We, there's another parable that teaches that, all right? So now let's move to uh, verse 37. He's going to give the, uh, the understanding of the parable. He's going, to, he's going to say it to us. The answer is said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. And that good seed is your Bible. That good seed also is your DNA. It's your DNA. God gave it to you. It's yours. Whether you like it or not, it's yours. Okay? And, you know, to be honest, there are things about me that... You probably wouldn't want to be, but that's okay because there's things about y'all that I'm looking, I'm going, God, thank you for not making me like them. Thank you for the DNA that I have. I'll keep it. Okay? Just, te just teasing with you. Not really. But anyway, so we know what seed is. We know, and, and think about it. I mean, I've said this before, but think of the time we live in. Think of the time we live in. In the last 10, 12 years, all you hear about is DNA, DNA, DNA. I, I remember very little being taught in, you know, grade school and high school about DNA, not, not being taught near as much about DNA as what, as what we know now. We had this 
explosion of knowledge about DNA. And when we read this Bible, we know what seed is. We know what it is in a, in a kernel of corn or in wheat or in whatever, in, in man seed. We know what that is. It's a bundle of DNA that God wrote for that creature, for that animal, for that plant, for us. And it's written exactly like God's Word. Exactly like it. Including the number of letters it's written in. It's written in 22 amino acids, 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. It's the same. Okay? You know, you got the Old Testament, you got this rung over here made of light and sugar. Light and sugar, that's the Bible. Then this one over here, here's the Old Testament, here's the New Testament, joined together by four base pairs. That's the four Gospels. It matches your Bible perfect. So we know what this is now. Now that we know what it is, it's like being a watchman on the wall and you see an enemy coming in the form of, we're going to rewrite the book. To me, an enemy would be someone who says, y'all are using a stupid Bible. We exalted scholars have rewritten the entire scriptures and made them better. And we want you to take this in your church. And I'd say absolutely not. We're not touching it. Likewise, genetically modified food. I don't think it's better. I don't think man knows what he's doing to the balance of nature. God had it all balanced out. So let's change all the mosquitoes in Africa so nobody gets malaria anymore. But you have no idea what else in nature you're doing. You have no idea. Okay? Let's modify the corn, the wheat, the soybeans. Let's modify the cattle. Let's modify the chicken. Let's modify the pork. Let's modify goats. Let's modify creatures in the wild. Let's modify them and let's modify man. And we have no idea what we're doing. We, didn't, we can't see the, the, and the outcome of man monkeying around, literally, with God's book that he wrote for every living creature. We have no idea what we're doing. And the devil is behind this. That's what your Bible's teaching you. You now know the spirit that is behind genetic transformation in this world. It's the devil. It is his attempt at sowing tares in among the wheat. The wheat is the good DNA that God gave it. The tares... The bad stuff that man has come up with. Okay? So, uh, the enemy that sowed them, uh, the, the, seed, the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. So, we go back to Genesis 3, and there he is. He's sowing it. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. Man, think about that. Think about where everything is headed. The Son of Man shall send his, forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. Can you think of a story in the Bible where there's a furnace of fire? And who was cast in it? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and... The Son of God in there with them. Okay? So anyway, then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now, I've done this before here. Can we do it again? Okay? Um, Debbie, you look up here on the screen. I have wheat in one picture and tares in the other. Tell me which one is which. And your best educated wise, experienced wisdom. Which one's wheat and which one's tares? Oh, come on. Help her out. You can't tell? You say the wheat's on the what? On the right? This, my right? You're right. Now, two books called Holy Bible. One of them was sown 
by the Son of God. One sown by the enemy. By the way, when you guess which Bible, you'll know which one's, okay? So the right hand, right? They're conversing amongst themselves. They're trying to get it all figured out. The right hand? Well, we'll see. Because, and I've taught this before, but I'm going to do it again. We know why God wanted to wait till the harvest. God designed, if you look tears up at Wikipedia, it's called Poison Darnell. And the Poison Darnell grows like this little tiny fungus on its wheat kernels that is an intoxicant and a poison. And if it's consumed, first thing it does is kind of makes you out of your head. And then what it does after that is that it kills you. Okay? So, I mean, this story has got deep, deep theological meaning. But here's the thing. When poison darnel or tares is ready for harvest, they know it because it turns black. And the first time I read that, I went, what color does wheat turn when it's ready for harvest? Now look up here. Now can you tell? You picked what, what side? <laughs> she just threw you under the bus. The verse that I have on the right side says, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. That's tares. That's poison. That's not the word of God. Okay? So now you see what the devil has done. He hates the Bible. His greatest enemy, his greatest enemy is the word of God. By the way, if you go back and look, I mean, you look at those, that wheat, right? And if you go back and look, what he said here, then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun. Look at it. What color is it? Color of the sun. This Bible. And God knew what he was talking about. Amen? Now go to uh, Mark chapter 4. This is another parable. There, there's a parallel to this. Matthew 13 has it. Mark 4 has a a little bit different way, to, way that it puts it. But you can use Matthew 13's version. You can use Mark's version. You can use, Luke, use Luke's version. You're going to get the same idea. That in Matthew 13, Matthew 13 might want to do your own study on, you can see that in place after place after place, the devil is out to destroy the Word of God. He's out to destroy the power and the effect of the Word of God. In Mark chapter 4, we have the parable of the seed and the sower. And the seed of the sower is, the sower sows good seed, okay? But some of it falls by the wayside. Well, when it falls by the wayside, the Bible says, it came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Falls by the wayside. So verse 14 of Mark gives you the reason why. These are they which are by the wayside where the word is sown, but when they've heard, Satan comes immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. Here's the devil. Now, there, there's just some people that we know, their life is just by their, because of their actions, because of their sin, because of their lifestyle, there are devils around them at all times or in them. And this is why when you, let's say somebody tried to witness to them or you tried to hand them some sort of gospel tract or you... You were giving them verses out of the Bible. They immediately rejected it. And it's like the devils that are in their life just consumed it out of them so that it has no effect whatsoever in their life. Bible? What's a Bible? Uh, the Bible was written by men. Uh, that was all made up stories. I don't believe that. And that is the devil in their life just eating up. And, it's, and you can give them the word of God. The devil's just making it gone just like that. Why? Is it because the devil's hungry? No. He hates that Bible, and he does not want that Bible to have any profound effect in that man or that woman's life. 
period. And what was, what's troubling to me is when I was a child, we would have uh, somebody almost every summer come out to our neighborhood that we lived in and have a, have a Bible summer camp at somebody's house and just about every kid in our neighborhood would go to the Bible summer camp and we'd hear Bible stories and a lady would witness to us and teach us the gospel. And that's where I first learned of the, the wordless book, you know, where it's got the red page and the white page and black page and all that stuff. You've never seen it. It's pretty neat. That's where I first introduced to it and, 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 and try to lead children to the Lord. That was back in the 70s. You can't do that anymore. Number one, parents are not going to let their kids go. They're not going to, because a lot of parents don't want their kids going to church and getting saved because they don't want them coming home and saying, Mom, you, you and Dad need to quit drinking. You need to quit smoking pot. You need to quit uh, chasing around on the Internet. You need to quit doing all this stuff because Jesus died for you. They don't want their kids coming home with that stuff. So no, my kid can't go to church. My kid can't go to your place. No, churches that used to run... Bus after bus after bus cannot run buses anymore because they cannot pick kids up anymore. Number one, it's liability. And number two, parents just don't want them gone. They don't want them going to church. So that's, that's the drastic effect that the devil and the impact that the devil has had in my lifetime. It's what I've seen with my own eyes in my lifetime. He has taken away the word immediately out of people's hearts, and they want nothing to do with it. They want nothing to do with your church, with your gospel. They're not going to send their kids. They're not going to do anything. They've just hardened against it. But it's the, the devil's attack on the Word of God. He does not want that book to have any effect in their life whatsoever. If you look on down, the very next thing he mentions... Verse 7, and some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. Thorns, if you turn to, um, turn to uh, 2 Corinthians, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and look in verse 7, the Bible's going to tell you what these thorns represent. Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. And then he said, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. Lest I should be exalted above measure. Paul had to deal with that every day. He had to deal. Whatever that thorn was, he had to deal with it every day. Paul said he was buffeted daily. Daily. Devils came after him. Devils were on him. Did God deliver him from them? Yes, when he cut his head off. Then Paul was free. But as long as he abode on this earth, he had to deal with that thorn or those thorns. And he said it was a messenger of Satan above me. Now take that now and look back here at Mark chapter 4. Even though it mentions, you know, cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches and lust of other things, you're still dealing with devils who are more than happy to bring this stuff in to your life and to keep it. So what happens is, the thorns choke out the word, and it yields no fruit. So these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and lust of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. It's not choking you. It's choking the word out. Keeping the word from having any effect, from bearing fruit in your life. That's what the devil's doing in people all over this world. Let's say they came into church. Let's say that they uh, got down on their knees and they asked God to save them. Let's say that they got up and said, boy, I'm a Christian now. And they go back out and the devil's there and they don't, they don't have any desire to give up the flesh. They don't have any desire there. And the thorns that are in their life do nothing but choke out the uh, positive effects that the Word of God would have had in their life. But it doesn't allow it to, take, to, to bring forth and manifest any fruit in their life. And if there's one thing I've seen in 40-some-odd years of church attendance, that's what I've seen. People come down and supposedly let God make a change in their life and then just give it time. I remember one guy. Man, I love this guy. He, he, uh, he got, I say he got saved. I don't know what he did, but 
he come down the altar and everything was fine. He had a, had a beautiful wife and family. And, and then, you know, he's in serving the Lord in the church, you know. And, and I liked him. And I mean, I, just, I was just drawn to him. I thought he was the neatest guy in the world. And we did things together, hit the church and this and that and the other. And all of a sudden, he just started laying out. Not showing up for church. And I could see that, you know, I was a teenager, so I wasn't aware really of all that was going on. But what was going on is, he was a good-looking guy. That went to his head. So he's out running around on his wife with other women. And she's coming to church wanting her marriage fixed. And he's out running around. I mean, I remember he ended up in the hospital. I remember going to the hospital. He sent her in the hospital bed reading Playboy. I'm just going, what are you doing? It's thorns. Choking it. Choking the word out. Okay? The devil hates this book. Hates it. Turn to Jude. Jude's got one chapter. So in verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful me to, for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. Faith comes by way of the Word of God. The more preaching you hear, the more you grow in faith. And the devil knows it. So we contend, my, if you guys know me, my interest is not so much in the outward manifestations, not so much in what people, what good people are doing, because I want to tell you something. Catholic nuns, outdo all of us as far as good deeds. But the truth of it is, that's all they've got. They don't believe salvation by grace through faith. They believe in salvation by performance for Mary. It's what they believe. So I'm not looking for all the good works in everybody. What I'm interested in is when you have a trial in your life, do you still believe what God said? When you have failed God miserably in life, and you just, uh, you just seem like a wreck, do you still believe what God said? That was the purpose of the trial to begin with. It was the trying of your faith. And faith is believing what God said. So I am an earnest contender for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares. You never know the snakes that are behind you. Who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ, they deny that. Contrary to the faith, contrary to the word of God. The devil has his agents. Has them working in denominational uh, boardrooms. Has them working in publishing houses. Has his men working in music studios. Has his men working in Bible colleges and seminaries. He's got his men there to stop the power and the effect of the Word of God, to stop it cold in his tracks. Okay? So, in Acts chapter 20, turn there. Acts chapter 20. This the last things that Paul was saying on this earth. He is aware that after he leaves, the wolves are going to come in. I have been, um, by the grace, 
by the grace of Almighty God, this month I have been pastor of this church 22 years. Okay? By the, no, 21. 21 years. And it's by God's grace. A man that's been here that long, the church just sort of, you know, it just kind of builds around the man is what it does. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's just how it works. My concern is always what happens after I'm gone. Because I can tell you that I've seen it time and time again, a church thriving, pastor, godly man, he's preaching the old time way, people are responding to that, everything's good, something happens to him, he retires, he dies, or he gets too old and too sick, or some tragic thing happens, or the devil gets to him and he runs off with somebody else, I mean, I've just seen, I've seen it all happen, but in that transition process, the devil has his men waiting in the wings to take over that church and then move it away from the position that it once held in the Word of God. It, that's how it happens. Okay? Um, so, I won't ever die. How's that? Okay? I'm going to be pastor for the next 1,000, 1,200 years maybe. I don't know. But look at what Paul said. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves. Who's he talking to? Yourselves. Each one of you individually. And to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. God purchased with his own blood. God's blood. Amen? For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, of your own selves shall men arise. Now that's where it gets scary. Of your own selves shall men arise. I've seen in my lifetime, men that I thought always stood for the right and the truth, I've seen them change in my lifetime. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things. Now that, that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to speak dirty, nasty words. Okay? When something perverse has the word verse in it, when they speak perverse things, they are perversions of God's word. Here's God's truth, and what is coming out of their mouth is perverse in that it has corrupted and perverted the truth of the word of God. So anyway, they're going to speak perverse things, and the reason to do that is to draw away disciples after them. So, you got people all over the world that whenever Joel Osteen writes a new book, well, they're out there to get it. We're not the only church, by the way, that people travel hundreds of thousands of miles to come sit here. They do that with Joel Osteen. They do that with uh, Rick Warren. They do that with some of these other guys. They, oh, they, oh, I just got to hear him speak. Oh, I just want to, I just want to go and hear that. The lady that called us Bethel, actually wanting the other Bethel church out in Redding, California, she wanted to go and get that experience. She wanted to go and, I guess, get that fire tunnel or that grave sucking or whatever it is they did where they contact the dead. That's what she wanted. Okay, and uh, I'm just saying that. These people, instead of being a disciple for the Lord Jesus Christ or a disciple of Christ, they become disciples of these men, of these writers of books or these ministers of radio programs or whatever it is. And, uh, I mean, I know there's people that follow us on the Internet, and I get that. 
But if your, if your doctrine and your decisions and your life is hinged upon anything that I say, the devil can unhinge it with what somebody else says. Don't put it on me. Make sure that it came from God. Make sure it came from the Lord Jesus Christ. Make sure that He is the foundation of your life because if He's not, after I'm gone, you're gone. They'll draw you away. So verse 31, Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to, here it is now, to the word of His grace. What did He just commend you to? The word, the Bible. Paul said, After I'm gone, you clutch that Bible and don't let go. Okay? I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Whoever had been following Paul simply for Paul's sake, they fell out after Paul died. You remember, that's what the Sanhedrin was discussing when Peter or John was out preaching Christ. One of them stood up and said, Now, fellas, you know, you remember back several years ago, there was this one guy made a lot of noise amongst our people and drew away people after him. But after he died, they all just kind of went away. And then we had this other fellow kind of doing the same thing. And then he drew people after him. And then, you know, we, he died. And they all just fell away. Now, if this Christ man is of no more prominence than they are, why don't we just sit and wait it out and these people will die off? But, if this man's the Christ, the Son of God, we're all in trouble. And they were, because he is. Amen? If you build your house on what a man says, what a man does, and how a man tells you to do it, when he goes away, it will go away. I, that's what I've seen in my life. When you build your house on the Word of God and the Word of His grace, that house, that Bible will build you up and give you an inheritance long after I'm gone off the scene. Okay? I, I, I kind of want to say, I hope that when I die, all my videos get deleted off the Internet. I kind of want to say that. Because, but then part of me is like, well, he being dead yet speaketh. Okay, I, I get that part. But I don't want you building anything on me. I want you to build it on this Bible and nothing else. Okay, the devil hates me. Yes, he hates me. He'll try to get rid of me. Maybe God will let him succeed. That'll be fine. Then God will raise up somebody else, take my place. That's no big deal. Preachers come and go. The Word of God abides with you forever. Okay. That's why the devil hates it. That's why he hates it. And he hates you for believing it. And he hates you for promoting it. And as long as you stare the devil down and say, Devil, I believe this Bible. You can't do anything about it. He will try. And he'll go after you. And he'll try to burn you. And he'll try to get at you. He will try to get you to waver a little bit. Try to get you to go this way or go that way. Just hang on to it. Like it's your life, okay? Because it is. Let's stand to our feet. <clears throat> Father, I love you. And God, I have been through the storms. I have followed men. And in many cases, those men let me down. So I've decided, Lord, not to follow men anymore. Just follow the Word. I love this Bible. I love what it's done for me. I love what it's done for my family. I love what it continues to do in my family and what it's doing in people in this church I love. And I thank you for it. And I thank you, dear God, that you have built in this place uh, such a ministry as what you've given us Father all because of the Bible and I thank you Lord for those that have said to us 
Pastor, as long as you keep preaching that book, we'll keep listening. Lord, that's a, that's a prize for me. That's, I'll take that, Lord. I'll wear that proudly. So, Father, I pray, dear God, I, I believe my mind's already made up, Father, but just in case it's not, Lord, that you just, Lord, don't ever let me walk away from one word in this book. Anchor me, concrete me down, fasten me with nails, whatever you got to do, Father, but anchor me to this precious book. And, Father, for these people's lives and their futures and their eternity, Lord, it's hinged upon this book. If this book says it, then that's how it is. If this book is this way, then that's how everything is. And Father, we have learned to accept that. We've learned to believe it. We've learned to trust it. And Father, I believe, Lord, that these people are not ever going to turn away from that. And I thank you for it. But Lord, that doesn't mean that the devil is just going to give up and leave us alone. In fact, Lord, he's going to go after us harder than he does anybody else. He's going to try to shake us, going to try to shake our faith. He's going to try to shake our fellowship. He's going to try to just stir up one grief after another in hopes that maybe we'll say, you know what, this ain't worth it. I'm out of here. I'm done. I don't need church anymore, and I don't need this. And Lord, I know the thoughts that go through our minds when the devil's just really getting us. And so, Father, with each one of us who have our thorns, God, would you continue, if you won't remove the thorn, God, would you continue to just provide grace to help us, Father, to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. And Father, for those that have just decided they're just going to believe the Bible and nothing else, Lord, we know that the devil is not going to make their road easy. But Father, you said that you'd be with us, Jesus, that you would guide us every day and that you would never leave us, you'd never forsake us. And so, Lord Jesus, the very thing that the devil tries to, to take us away from, which is your word, Lord, just, Father, just reaffirm in us our love and our desire to know more about this book, to know what it says, to know what it is that we believe and why we believe it, to just ensure it and instill it in our hearts. Lord, you've told us in your word, that you have secured us and sealed us with that Holy Spirit of promise. And Father, it's these promises that we're basing every part of our lives on. This Bible is either right in everything or it's wrong in everything. And Father, we believe it's right. Help us to hold on to it. Hold on to us when we get tired and weary. Bless your word tonight. I love these people. I pray that you'd bless them with it in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 God bless you.